Good morning, my name is Josiah Bradford. I'm a student leader here at the Hill Youth Group. I want to welcome you to this online gathering. Nowadays, I'm sure most of us are ready to go back to society and are feeling pretty lonely in this quarantine. But Deuteronomy 31.8 says, The Lord himself goes before you and will be with you. He will never leave you or forsake you. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. So when you feel alone, just know that God is with you and will never leave you or forsake you. I know that online church is a bit different, but we're all trying to make lemonade out of lemons. I encourage you to fully engage in the service today. For the next hour, I want you to set aside all other distractions and engage in worship and make the room you are in your personal altar to the Lord. Before we begin, there are a couple of housekeeping notes. If you haven't yet downloaded the Church Center app, we strongly encourage you to do so. It will make this time of online church much simpler for you. We encourage you to continue having a worldwide impact by tithing and giving. There are four different ways to do so. One, directly from the Church Center app. Two, by text. You can text any amount to 84321. That's in any amount to 84321. And three, you can click give in, at our website at www.harvesthill.church. And four, you can mail it to P.O. Box 506, Midlothian, Texas, 76065. If this is your first time seeing a Harvest Hill Church service, or if you'd like more information about this church, we invite you to keep plugging in and come visit us when this virus ends. In the meantime, in the video description, there is a link for you to click to get more information about Harvest Hill Church. Our youth and children's ministry also has an online service. A brief kids lesson was posted earlier this morning, and our youth services are posted every Wednesday at 6.30. We encourage you to stay connected through our online channels in the coming days. Our pastoral staff is working hard and we are here for you, so reach out if you have any needs at all. Lastly, in this digital service presents an amazing opportunity for you to share the gospel and a biblical encouragement to the world. So click share on this video and tell the world about Jesus. I hope you enjoy this time of worshiping Jesus and listening to the message brought by my dad, Pastor John Bradford.
Jesus, I love you. Jesus, I love you. 
rescued me. Love came down and said, Be free. I'm yours. I am forever yours. Mountain high, valley low. I'll sing out, remind my soul that I'm yours. I am forever yours. If you love King. Well, good morning, Harvest Hill Church. It is so good to be with you again. Uh, my name is John Bradford. I have the honor of being one of the uh, elders here at Harvest Hill Church. I'm also the director of adult education and also one of the marriage and family pastors. Today, uh, we're going to be continuing on with our series for putting the first things first or, or discipleship, uh, our discipleship program. Uh, and the section that we're on now is on, uh, is on disciplines. Now, we've been on it for a while. We're coming to the close. Let's wrap up where we've been. So last time we met, we were dealing with the personal disciplines, and the disciplines are just things that don't come naturally to our own flesh, things that we have to do that are good for us or good for others, but we just don't feel like doing them all the time, but we still, uh, we still have to rule over them and have to take them uh, under our control and do what needs to be done. So last time we looked at some of the personal disciplines that we go through, uh, for, and we broke that into two categories. So first we looked at uh, the inner disciplines, intrinsic things, things that happen on the inside of us. So these would be things like uh, fasting, personal prayer, or finding an inner solitude when things are crazy. 
Then next we looked at uh, the outer solitude, or excuse me, the outer uh, disciplines, the, the public things, the things that we do that are seen publicly or extrinsically. So these would be things like uh, living a life that is simple or frugal or within our means. Uh, sometimes having physical solitude where you need to physically get away and find some peace. Or submission to authority, which has both uh, an internal and an external component to it. You have an internal uh, uh, component where you decide to follow that authority, and then you have an external component where you actually obey what is done and others can see it. So where we are today, we're now moving on from personal disciplines to corporate disciplines. So corporate disciplines are just the things that we do, that we have to do together, and they don't necessarily come naturally to us. So before we do, let's pray. Father God, we just thank you so much uh, for this time we get to come together and be in your word. Father, I pray that uh, nothing that is of me would remain, but only the things that are of you would remain, uh, take deep root and bear good fruit so that your name is honored and glorified in all we do. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, the irony that uh, I am today speaking to you about uh, corporate disciplines, about meeting together, uh, the irony of that is not wasted on me. I realize uh, that we're all under this mandatory quarantine, uh, but as we're going to see, there is more to the corporate body, to being the body of Christ, than just physically being together. It is a part of it, and it's important, uh, but there are other avenues and other ways that we can attack it. All right, so let's get started. Whenever this topic comes up, the, one of the first questions you'll always get is, is it a sin not to go to church? Well, I can answer that by saying it can be. And I don't mean to be elusive, but there's several variables in it. But let's, let's break that question down. So first off, let's identify uh, and just go back and, and remember what sin is. Sin, by its definition, is just missing the mark. Uh, and let me also clarify what this, what this statement is not. Um, it's not a sin if you can't get to church, if your car is broken, if you're not feeling well, um, if, I don't know, there's a giant virus running through the country, um, if you're in a time of mourning, you just need some space, some time to yourself. And so, so that is a different aspect of what we're talking about. So let's then look at what actually is the mark. What's the standard that God sets for us? So we're going we're gonna to look at the word. We're going to look at Hebrews 10.25. The word of God is, is the foundation for everything we do. And so this is what, what all these disciplines, all this doctrine, all these discipleship uh, courses, these are all come from the word of God, and that's our instruction book. So this sets up our mark, our target, our goals. So let's see what that actually is. All right, so in Hebrews 10, 25, it says, let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another. Now, Pastor Nelson just recently encouraged us not to be the some people. Don't do what some people do. Don't neglect the coming together. However, since we're talking about a sin issue, let's look a little closer at what it actually means to neglect. Now, the Greek word here is enkatalipo, which means to abandon, to leave in the straits, to utterly forsake. Uh, Jesus himself used this, used this word in Matthew 27 and Mark 15 when he's, when he's hanging on the cross. And he says, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which is to say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Or what, my God, why have you encatalipo me? Now, for some of us, we're going to jump into the Wayback Machine uh, and go back to a, a song from 1998, a Daryl Evans song called Trading My Sorrows. Uh, many of you should remember it because we sang it, and we sang it a lot. But it was a really good song, and there's a section in it that's taken from 2 Corinthians 4, 8, and 9. And I will uh, do my best to the author uh, not to sing it so I don't butcher the song horribly, um, set off car alarms, or make dogs uh, in the next county start barking. So I'm going to read, read the lines I'm talking about. So the, verse, the, the verses say, I am pressed but not crushed, persecuted not abandoned, struck down but not, re, but not destroyed. Some of you are humming the tune right now because you remember it. Uh, but what we're looking at is the line persecuted not abandoned, not in katalipo. 
Okay, so that then brings us to the question, have you neglected, have you forsaken, have you abandoned the meeting together with God's people? So if you have, then that runs counter to the command in Hebrews 10, 25, and therefore that is sin. Now that will then generate, if you've reached this point with somebody, that will generate the next question, then how do I know when you cross over to just not going and full on forsaking? Well, that's a question that's between you and Jesus. However, you also need to keep in mind, if it looks like a duck, quacks like a duck, it just might be a duck, all right? Now, even if you're not there yet, you might be in the neighborhood, okay? However, if, if you're having a hard time being honest, if you can't honestly answer this for yourself, we have a comforter. We have someone who can tell us. The Holy Spirit will tell you if you, if you are in this neighborhood. In fact, John 16, 8 tells us that the job of the Holy Spirit is to convict the world of sin. So if you're not sure, ask him. He will tell you and let him convict you. It's not a bad thing. Uh, and if you are in this neighborhood, if you have neglected the body, then here's the warning that I've laid down multiple times in this discipline section. It comes in Genesis 4, 7, when God is giving this warning to, uh, to Cain uh, because he, kn he, he knows what's coming. Uh, Cain is, is pondering killing his brother Abel. And so God gives him this warning. This warning is so applicable uh, to us today. God says, but if you refuse to do what is right, then watch out. Sin is crouching at the door and is eager to control you. In the King James Version, it says eager to have you, but you must subdue it and be its master. Uh, again, the conviction of the Holy Spirit is not a bad thing. Repentance is not a bad thing. If you've reached that point, repentance is all you have to do. And repentance just means change your direction. So if you're going one way, you do a 180 degree turn and you go the other way. And if you're going, if you're going in a direction that's destructive, it's not a bad thing to turn around. Sometimes a process, yes, hurts a bit. Hurts our ego, hurts our pride. We, want to admit, we don't want to admit things about ourselves that might be true. But let the Holy Spirit empower you to repent and change your directions. Now, let me also clarify that oftentimes not wanting to go, go to church may be due to a wound or a hurt or something that you received by the people there or a group of people there. And if that's the case, get the healing you need. Get, get into, into fellowship with some people that can help you. Here's my shameless plug for our whole life ministry. Uh, if you need to be led through deliverance so that you can get the freedom you need, get it. Okay, but let me also make another clarification here. Even if there is a real offense, if, 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 if you did nothing, someone offended you, someone came at you, let me make a couple clarifications. First off, your beef is really with the people. It is not with God. We do our best to be the hands and feet of Jesus, but we are not actually him. We are imperfect beings carrying a perfect love within us. And sometimes hurt people hurt people. So you've got to keep things focused on where the problem actually is. Also, secondly, if that, is, if that has actually happened, it is still your responsibility for your actions and your responses. So what I'm encouraging here, if there is one actual sin, please don't make it two by allowing sin to get you, separate you from the body of Christ and get you into sin because that makes one, two sins out of one, and that's not where we want to go. But let's look at then what we do want to do, what the purpose of, 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 the, of the corporate gathering is. Obviously, it's meeting together. And, the, and one of the reasons behind this is that you just need others. And the other side of that coin is others need you. We all have unique giftings and talents and callings, and they are, they are built up and they reach its fruition so that God is glorified when all those things are working together. One of the common errors you will often hear people say is, ah, I don't need to worship God. Um, they, they may throw this, this hypothetical one out at you. Um, if I was shipwrecked on a desert island, could I still be a Christian? Well, to that one, it's an easy answer. Yes, you could. However, since you're talking to me here in Midlothian in Texas, you're obviously not on a desert island. So if you're not on a desert island, don't act like one, okay? And 
In principle, yes, you can worship God anywhere. But when we talk about the coming together of the body of Christ, we just saw that in Hebrews 10, it's clearly a commandment and it's something you don't need to avoid. All right. Now, Let's look, let's look at, the, at the first of these, uh, of, the, of these elements. The reasons we come together, number one, we need each other. In James 5.16, it says, Let us confess our sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. Now, obviously, you can't confess your sin one to another if you're not with another. And you can't pray for each other if you're not with another another. Now, we have been given uh, the gift of technology that allows us to do things that weren't available to the, to, the, uh, to the early church. For them, not being together meant you really couldn't be together, okay? They could not see someone's face. They could not spend time together. They couldn't have that face time. Face time. See what I did there? But we now have that, that available to us, so now let's go ahead and use it and let's maintain uh, let's maintain uh, the corporate body together, all right? And to illustrate this, God uses the metaphor of a, of a whole human body, which is made up of different parts. So let's take a look at this. This is in 1 Corinthians 12, 12. And it said, just as a body, though one body has many parts, and its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. Let's look at the next one. In verse 21, let's drop down a little bit. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. The head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. Each body part has a very specific job. And you oftentimes don't realize how important that job is till you don't have it. That body part can't fulfill its purpose unless all the things are working together. Let's come back to our example of, uh, of joining, the, joining the army or enlisting that we've used many times, where the individual becomes part of the whole. Now, when you've got one individual and one individual and there's a conflict, that's a fight. However, when you have a group and you have a group and there's conflict, that's a battle. When there's a whole bunch of battles, then that's a war. We get, this, uh, we get this clarification from David and Goliath. In fact, we get it from Goliath himself. In 1 Samuel 17, verse 8, Goliath stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, why do you come out and line up for battle? Some translations say, why do you line up in an array or why do you line up in ranks? Choose a man and have him come down to me and we will fight. If he is able to kill me, we will be your subjects. Now, so we've got, we've got this idea, one-on-one, -on -one, that's a fight. But what we're dealing with now, if you're, going to, if you're going against a group, you need a group to help you. You are not able to handle this fight, this battle on your own. Now, at the time of Jesus, the Romans were the military power in the world. They were highly disciplined. They were strong as individuals. They were strong as a group. And they had a, a maneuver that was incredibly effective. It was called the testudo formation. Testudo is Latin for tortoise shell. And what they would do, they, they all got together in, in close proximity and they raised their shields on all sides. So they essentially formed a human tank. So the people in the front held their, their shields up to prevent the attacks directly fr in front of them. Uh, the people in the middle would hold their shields up above and would be protected from attacks coming from above. The people on the sides would hold their shields out in those directions and then protect the group from attacks coming from the sides. And uh, uh, this was a, a particularly effective when they were being protected from projectiles, from rocks, stones, arrows, anything flying at them. Uh, this essentially made the group almost invulnerable. Now, how does this play out? How did this play out for the Romans and how does this play out for us? Well, let's take a look. Let's say you're coming up against an enemy that's up on a wall. Uh, you're outnumbered, let's just say 20 to one. They're entrenched. Uh, they've got their defenses. They're on an elevated position. And between you and them is this no man's land. But for you personally, let's say this is, a, this is an area of your life where God has told you specifically is yours, but you need to go and you need to fight and you need to conquer it. However, there's a whole host of enemies that are there that are coming against you. 
And in this no man's land between you and the enemy, you're getting hammered. You're getting hit with fiery darts from the enemy. The enemy is attacking your health. He might be attacking your finances. He might be attacking your marriage, your family, your children. He might be attacking your very walk with God. You might be uh, experiencing what's called the dark night of the soul. Um, so how do you get through? How do you get through this through this no man's land? Well, you when you're fighting the group on your own, you don't do it on your own. You get together with like-minded believers, and you raise your shields of faith. So what? And you form. And what you're going to do? You're going to form that testudo. You're going to form uh, that tortoise shell so that you can take on the enemy and send the enemy fleeing. So here's how it plays out in your life. If the enemy is attacking your health, you need to find someone or a group of people that God has delivered through a health crisis. He has healed them miraculously. He has used them miraculously to heal others. And they have that faith. It's strong and they can come with you and they can stand with you and they can pray for faith, for healing, and they have the faith to believe it. If your finances are being attacked by the enemy, find someone that God has delivered, uh, done a financial miracle for, or use them to be a miracle for someone else. Their shields are up high and it's strong. They have the faith to stand with you and believe for the breakthrough in those finances. If your marriage or your family or your children are under attack, get someone who has come through something where God has been strong for them and they'll be strong for you. If your walk with God is being attacked, if you're in that dark night of the soul, get with someone who's been through that and God has been faithful and it'll be strong and they can be strong for you and with you. Now, the testudo was not just about protection. The testudo also could be used offensively. Sometimes when they were coming, coming up against an elevated position, they, uh, the Romans would put their shields together on an angle. In other words, the, peop- the people in the front uh, would stand and hold their shields up. The people in the middle would crouch a little bit and hold their shields up. The people at the end would kneel down and hold their shields up. So they would essentially form a ladder so that other troops then could get up it and break through the enemy's defenses and take the land and accomplish the goal. All right, next. The next element of coming together corporately is for sharing fellowship and miracles. Now let's look, if we're, if we're looking at how church is done, let's take a look at at the time when the New Testament church had just been born. We're going to Acts chapter two. Now let's set the stage a little bit to see how this plays out. So uh, at the end of his time here, Jesus Jesus has been crucified. Uh, he's been buried. He's, he's gone and got the keys of hell and death. He's demonstrated his power. He's risen from the dead. And he has been seen and touched by the disciples. And he's given the great commission to now go and preach to all the world in Matthew 28. Similar instructions were given in Mark 16, Luke 24, and John 20. Now at the start of the, of the book of Acts, remember Acts is a continuation of the book of Luke. So in Acts 1 verse 3, uh, we're told specifically that Jesus appeared to them, the, the, the disciples, for a period of 40 days. He gives them the instruction, then he ascends to the Father. So these are the instructions we get in verse 4 and 5. He says, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my Father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Now we're told at the time there was 120 of them. And we know that they waited for 10 days praying in the upper room. How do we know they prayed for 10 days? Well, in all the four Gospels, we're told that Jesus was crucified on Passover. And in Acts 2, we're told that they were meeting on the day of Pentecost. Now, Pentecost then is 50 days from Passover to Pentecost. And we're told in chapter 1 that Jesus was with them for 40 days. So that remaining 10 was the time they were on their own to pray and seek God. This is incredibly important when you look at these festivals and the, and the, and the times at, at which all these things happened. Now on, on Passover, 
It commemorates when uh, the Jews were freed from Egypt. Uh, those that believed God's warning killed a spotless lamb, applied the blood of the lamb to the doorpost, and the, and the death angel passed over them, and they were led free. Now, Jesus is our spotless lamb, and those that believe his warning have applied his blood to, uh, to their lives, and, and the, de- the second death, eternal death, has now passed over, and they are free uh, to walk in full and wholeness. Now, the, the words used for the time of Passover, or excuse me, for Pentecost are also different. Pentecost is a Greek word, uh, which means 50 days or seven weeks. Uh, the Hebrew word is Shavat, which means seven or weeks. It's a time of, of, of seven weeks. Now, this, this uh, time of Pentecost or Shavat is called the Festival of Weeks in Deuteronomy 16. It's the, called the Festival of Reaping in Exodus 23. It's called the Festival of First Fruits in Numbers 28, which is incredibly important, which you'll see here in just a second. Also at this, at this Festival of Weeks, uh, at, at this time of Pentecost, was also a commemoration of when the law came down, when Moses brought the law down from Mount Sinai. And so now in Acts 21, we're, or excuse me, Acts 2, verse 1, we're told that on, when the day of Pentecost came, they, the 120, were all together in one place. The Holy Spirit falls and dews them with power. There's a loud sound of a loud wind, noise, chaos, confusion, sound gathers people around. Uh, the 120 are gifted with uh, the ability to speak in other tongues and other languages. They go out and they begin preaching about Jesus in the other languages of the people that are witnessing it. And it's clear that these people would not be able to speak in this number of languages. Um, and so it's clearly a miracle that's happening. Peter steps forward and he gives this amazing message. And at this time, 3,000 people get saved. And this is an amazing bookend considering that uh, the day of Pentecost celebrates the giving of the law. Well, when the law was given in Exodus, Remember, Moses comes down, but the, the people have lost faith and they're now worship, they're worshiping a golden calf, an idol. They've fallen into idolatry. And to cleanse that, then 3,000 people die at the giving of the law. But now we're at the giving of the Spirit and 3,000 people come to life. It's an amazing correlation. So coming back to the church, let's drop down to verse 42 and see how things are going for them because the church has now just exploded from 120 to 3,000 in one day. That's some serious church growth. So let's see what's happening to them in Acts 2, verse 42. It says, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and the breaking of bread and to prayer. So there's four main things that they did, and they devoted themselves. In other words, they focused completely, entirely on these things. So they focused on the apostles' teaching. The apostles, the ones that walked with Jesus, they saw the miracles, they experienced the miracles. They saw the transfiguration, they saw him rise, they touched him, they talked with him, they learned his ways, he taught them. Freely they had received and now freely they are giving. They also devoted themselves to fellowship. The Greek word here is koinonia, which we also get the word communion or a common union. They shared things in common. They shared their highs and their lows, their successes and failures. They shared life together. Uh, the breaking of bread is incredibly important because it speaks to sharing of necessities. You have to eat no matter what you're going, what your life is going through, high or low, you've got to eat and not everybody had the money for it. So it says people sold property. They brought things together. They shared the needs so that everyone could eat and continue on. And most importantly, they dedicated and, and, uh, devoted themselves to prayer. And anytime you have a group of people all gathered together, focused and praying, amazing things happen. So let's see what happened when these individuals formed a group and focused everything they had, all their resources, all their energy, all their worship, all their prayers to expanding the kingdom. Let's look at the next verse, verse uh, Acts 243. Then everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. And all the believers were together and had everything in common. So by following their example, we can see the original design for the church. The original design was for unity, community, 
miracles, sharing needs, protection. Because also don't forget at this time, there was still a lot of persecution against the followers of Jesus. But how many of you know, if you're going to be uh, protected against persecution, it's better to be in a group of 3,000 than 120. So another element that, uh, that, the, that the, the corporate gathering brings. All right, thirdly, let's look at the, the, third, uh, the third important element of corporate, corporate meetings and things that we have to do that don't come naturally. The third idea is spiritual multiplication, um, how the kingdom of God expands, how people come in, how souls are won, how lives are changed. And we get this, uh, we get this from a verse in Matthew 18, verse 19. Jesus says, again, truly I tell you that if two of you on earth agree about anything they ask for, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. Verse 20, for where, and this is one most of you know, for where two or three gather in my name, there I am with them. So there is a, there's a promise of power and provision and protection for the group as the group prays. Now, don't forget, God is not one or the other. He's both, okay? He, he gives these promises to the group, but there are also promises to the individual. Remember, he promises, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, be cast into the sea. So that promises to the individual, but it's also to the group. And the promise to the individual is magnified when it's part of that group. Campus Crusade for Christ has a great illustration on their website, uh, and they actually divide it into looking at it as multiplying or adding. So let's take a look at it. So the first example they get is for adding to the kingdom. And in this, in this situation, let's say you've received this amazing Billy Graham anointing, and you're able to lead, let's say, a thousand people to Christ in a year. Um, that would work out to somewhere around 166 people a month. That's a lot of people, but you do it, uh, you do it for, a, for the entire year. So you win 1,000 people for the year, and you do that for a time period of, let's say, 36 years. Okay, so math people, 1,000 people saved over 36 years is 36,000, right? That was some easy math. Now, uh, now for my math people, we're going to crank it up a notch. We're going to get into some algebra or for my, my uh, finance people, some uh, compounding interest. So now Campus Crusade uses this idea of multiplication. They say instead of one person adding a thousand people in a year, what if, he, if that one person generates three people, but each of those three people saved in the year are discipled and trained to save three more? Okay, so now we have three people that each save three, each lead, lead to Christ, three more people, okay? So we've got three times three, that's going to be nine, all right? Now those nine people are also trained and disciple to witness and bring three people each into the kingdom. And that gives us way more fingers than I have. We're now to 27. Those 27 also each bring three and so on and so on over that same 36 year time period. So now at the end of our 36 years, how many people have been added to the kingdom? Try this number on for size. 1,048,576. Now, we don't want to minimize the one person adding to the kingdom. That is important. They are using the gift that God gives them, and he is pleased with that. But we, we can clearly see when we add it together with the group, then the, the increase of the kingdom and the blessing to our Lord and Savior is multiplied and has a manifold, uh, manifold more return on that investment. Now, a crucial part uh, of adding to the kingdom is prayer. And this is where we're gathering with the corporate body becomes incredibly important, especially in the area of confession and intercession. Uh, that's where, where a group comes together and either prays for or prays on behalf of another group. It can also happen in the, in the, uh, uh, in the situation of reconciliation where one group stands in for another group and repents so that the second group can, can give forgiveness and receive healing. So even, and the, and the idea here, especially with reconciliation, is that even if you personally didn't participate in whatever that sin is, by being part of that group, you are guilty by association. And so it allows you to stand in and make that prayer and ask for that forgiveness. In 
1863, Abraham Lincoln made a proclamation to the entire country for a national day of prayer and fasting. Now, at this point in the Civil War, this is an, this is an important element as well. Um, the country is halfway through the Civil War. They're exactly halfway. Three months earlier, Abraham Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation. So it's been a horribly devastating war, and there is no end in sight. And it is clear that God has got to intervene if this shattered country is going to stay together. And Lincoln gets this, gets this principle. He gets this idea from Scripture. And we, and we can see that plays out in 2 Chronicles 7.14 where the Lord says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Remember earlier we said repentance is just turning. Turn from your wicked ways. Don't do the things that you did before. Then that, that opens up the door for blessing and promises. And let's see what those promises are. Then God promises, I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. So with so much in our land right now needing healing, the Spirit of God is constantly calling us to embody the words that Mr. Lincoln so eloquently used. And from his, from his proclamation, he said, he said that the country and anyone going through this process, needs to, we need to humble ourselves before the offended power before God, and to confess our national sins, and to pray for clemency and forgiveness. So during this time uh, of virus and quarantine and separation, it's still clear we need the corporate body. We still need each other. We still need to share one another's burdens. We still need to have that fellowship. We still need to see miracles happen, and we still need to multiply and add to the kingdom of God. Now, normally at this time in the service, uh, we would have the prayer team come down, and I'd ask you to come forward for prayer. Uh, obviously, you can't do that at, at this particular moment since we're, we're watching this virtually, uh, but you can do it yourself. Do it in your own time, and I would encourage you, if the Lord is moving on your heart, if, you, if the Holy Spirit is bringing some conviction, please respond. Please respond. Don't wait. Don't let, don't let it take too long. If there's something rumbling in your heart and you feel you're in danger of forsaking or you know that you really have forsaken the fellowship of the believers, let the Holy Spirit move in you. Let him convict you and then just repent, change your ways, ask for forgiveness and change. If you're in a battle, if you feel outnumbered and you're getting hit by fiery darts of the enemy, gather some, some believers together digitally come together, have them raise their shields, form that testudo, and advance and take back the enemy's ground. If you find you're burdened by some of our national sins and you want to see God heal our land, digitally call together some believers, gather them together, pray fast, confess your sins, confess our national sins, come together and watch God heal our land. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much for this time. Lord, we love you. We love your word. Uh, we pray that this will go deep and bear much fruit, um, Father, so that we can come together corporately and be stronger together and can honor and glorify your name. Father, we thank you so much. Uh, thank you for allowing me into your home. Uh, blessings, and y'all have a good day. We hope that you were encouraged by this time of worship and learning in the word with Pastor John Bradford. As always, our pastoral team is here and ready to pray for you. Please look in the description in the video uh, and complete the How Can We Pray For You form. We will be in contact. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for this time that we got to learn together. Uh, we may be separated physically, but we are united with you spiritually. I pray that you would bless us and protect us from the coronavirus that's going around. And um, just keep us safe. And may we all be here to join again next week. In Jesus' name, amen.